Good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to welcome you tonight to this presentation on the power of international education and exchange, Japan, United States, and the world. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Japan ICU Foundation and the US Japan Bridging Foundation. We have an extraordinary panel of experts with us tonight, all of whom are looking forward to sharing their take on the importance of international education and exchange between the US and Japan. This is going to be a lot of fun. Before we get started, just a, a brief introduction about myself and the foundation that I represent. My name is Tom Mason. I'm the executive director of the US Japan Bridging Foundation and hosting with the Bridging Foundation tonight, the lead sponsor is Japan ICU Foundation and Paul Hastings uh, is the executive director there and he will be moderating the panel. The US Japan Bridging Foundation is a nonprofit organization with a mission to inspire college students to stay and get connected with Japan. And we do that by providing semester and academic year scholarships to study abroad. We're completely donor funded. We've been running since 1999. Our key partner in this endeavor is the American Association for Teachers of Japanese. And tonight, Susan Schmidt is here on the panel with us. Susan has served as the executive director of the Bridging Clearinghouse Project since its establishment more than 20 years ago. Paul, I'm so excited about this panel tonight and um, uh, thank you. Could you please introduce the panel? Great, thank you so much, Tom, and thank you for um, partnering on this panel. Um, I want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us, um, whatever time of day it is um, where you are. Um, this week, we are celebrating International Education Week, um, and we're really happy to put together this uh, webinar in celebration of the power and importance of international education and exchange. Uh, before introducing our panelists, I'd like to say a few words about the Japan ICU Foundation and provide an overview of today's webinar. The Japan ICU Foundation uh, is an independent educational foundation with offices in New York City. Uh, we were established in 1949 as a post-war project of reconciliation between Americans and Japanese. And we played a key role in raising public support for the founding of International Christian University, ICU. ICU opened its doors in 1953 as Japan's first international liberal arts university. Uh, today, our mission is to nurture global citizens who contribute to the well being of humanity. And in close partnership with ICU, we engage in projects in three areas DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, sustainability, and peace building. International education and exchange have the potential to transform people. The experience of crossing cultural, national, and linguistic borders leads to a keener awareness of the world and of the self. And as we emerge from the global pandemic, students, researchers, policymakers, business people, practitioners of all sorts are once again starting to travel abroad. And developing and reaffirming meaningful personal and institutional relationships across borders is critically important in a post-pandemic world. We have so much to learn from each other and common problems that need to be addressed collectively. The pandemic has been extremely disruptive to international education and exchange. And with today, while today's discussion is not uh, meant to focus on uh, only on student exchange uh, within higher education, I'd like to share some statistics within this area to illustrate the disruption. According to the 2021 Open Doors Report, which was released just this week, international students studying in the US dropped by 15% last year. And according to the same report, US students studying abroad dropped by 53%. According to Japan's Immigration Services Agency, which is part of the Ministry of Justice, in the first half of 2021, only 7,078 international students entered Japan, which is an 88.5% decrease from the first half of 2019. Japanese students studying in the US have been gradually decreasing over the past 20 years since a peak of 47,000 in 2000, 2001. In 2018-19, only 18,105 Japanese students studied in the US. However, after the onset of the pandemic, 
In 2020-21, that number was 11,785. On the bright side, interest amongst US students in studying abroad in Japan has been increasing. In 2018-19, a record 8,928 US students studied abroad in Japan. However, in 2019-20, that number dropped to 3,406. And given Japan's entry ban on international students, which fortunately was just lifted, um, it is fair to assume that the number was close to zero in 2020-21. But enough of the depressing statistics. Today, we aim to look at the positive side and reaffirm the power and importance of international education and exchange within the context of Japan, the US, and the world. For the first hour or so, we will have a moderated discussion. And during the last 30 minutes, we will open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, please feel free to add your questions into the chat or the Q&A box anytime during the discussion. It's now my pleasure to introduce our three uh, distinguished panelists. And to save time, um, we will not be, um, I'll not be reading their bios right now. Um, we did share their bios um, in, on the registration page of, of Zoom, and you can find lots of information about them online. First, we have Kazuyo Kato. Uh, Kazuyo is the executive director of Japan at the Japan Center for International Exchange, USA. We next have Susan Schmidt. Susan is the executive director of the American Association of Teachers of Japanese. Um, and third, we have Matt Sussman the CEO and co-founder of New Voice Learning. Kazuyo, Susan, and Matt, thank you so much for joining us. All right, well, I'd like to start the webinar and the conversation by exploring the personal impact of international education on the three of you. And Kazuyo, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Um, if you could describe for us a meaningful international education or exchange experience you have had uh, reflecting perhaps on why the experience was powerful and how it has impacted your career and life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul, for inviting me to this uh, exciting conversation. I am a big beneficiary of international education myself, so I'm really uh, glad that I could be here uh, with Susan and Matt. Um, so my experience as international exchange and education happened early in my life and not by my, uh, under two different circumstances. And um, the first experience happened not by my choice, but because my father was in the Japanese foreign ministry. And so I accompanied him to his overseas post, which included Washington DC when I was nine years old and San Francisco when I was 16. Uh, and if you define international exchange and education as an experience where you have to adapt to an entirely new language and culture, I experienced that uh, in the United States as a Japanese student who just moved there, as well as as a returnee student in Japan who just spent years uh, trying to Americanize myself. Um, and so I had culture shocks in both countries, but these experiences had a tremendous impact on my later career decisions and life decisions. And so the second set of uh, international experience I had was uh, by my choice, I chose to go to the university in the United States and I chose to uh, pursue a career in the field of international relations. And to touch on how powerful my experiences were, I think I can think of um, three reasons why international education was powerful to me. Uh, the first is because they were so difficult. Um, it's extremely challenging to adapt to a new language and a new environment, particularly as a young teenager who's just trying to uh, grow a sense of self. And I experienced uh, a lot of uh, challenges in my high school years in the US because you're asked to read Shakespeare and um, join debates and make friends when you can't even fully express yourself in English. So um, I experienced a lot of frustration, disappointments, um, um, insecurities and, and, and regrets uh, because I couldn't perform as well as I wished I could. But it's these struggles that really make you change and bounce back. And that's the reason I decided to stay in the United States for college to become fluent in English and be able to express myself fully um, and also not take any culture or environment for granted. Um, 
uh, and, and realize the importance of bridging two different cultures. And I'll just briefly mention two other reasons. Um, uh, one is this uh, the powerful tool that I earned called English language. And uh, it's not just the, uh, being able to read um, Ameri more books or uh, watch American TV shows, but it's 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 more um, it's because through that language I can actually understand the culture that's behind uh, that language. And related to that, the final reason I would mention is um, through this experience I was able to identify unique strengths uh, of the United States and Japan that really made me uh, appreciate the complementary aspects of those strengths and I felt in my gut that these two countries can will really make a great team if we collaborated to leverage our respective strengths. So those were the things that I um, experienced through my education. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, so many follow-up questions popping into my head, but before I ask them, I want to give a chance to Susan and Matt to also share um, uh, you know, about their own experiences. Um, maybe, uh, Susan, if you don't mind, uh, could okay. you uh, describe a meaningful yeah. international um, experience okay. you've had? I, yeah, I, um, as, a, as a young person, I did not have a lot of international experiences. I went to a high school um, that was active in the American Field Service, the AFS exchange um, organization. And so during my years in high school, I got to know three or four international students who were attending my high school and um, living with families in the community and participating in the high school activities and they were from Iran, uh, Norway and Bolivia are the, the three that I that I remember very vividly. And it was it was so interesting to me. I, I got to know all of them fairly well at the time and it was really fascinating to meet people who, whose culture was a lot different. Um, they of course you know had pretty good English because, that's how they got to participate um, in the program, um, but that was uh, that was a that was probably my first. Those were my first real international contacts. Um, when I went to college, I did not study abroad, um, but about five or six years after graduating from college, I went to Japan. Um, intending really to just uh, have a short stay. I, this is a lot of people's stories, as, as, as many of you know. A lot of people go to Japan wanting to see what it's like and study a little Japanese and um, they end up staying a long time. And I did too. I ended up staying for more than 20 years. Um, I studied Japanese, but not full-time or seriously. Um, but I had been working as an editor um, in the US, uh, in New York actually, before going to Japan. And I ended up working uh, for two publishing companies in Japan as an editor. Um, the, longest, the longest term was at the University of Tokyo Press where I edited the books in English. They are, they are basically a Japanese scholarly publisher, but they also published and still publish books in English um, translations of research, uh, some literature translations and so on. And I spent, um, I spent quite a number of years working there and learning, being, really being part of that, a scholarly community and a Japanese scholarly community, which was very different from the ones that I had known in the United States. So that was, so there, there was a sort of language exchange and also a cultural exchange. And the fact, also the fact that I lived there and um, raised a family there. Um, so they were sort of immersion experiences rather than scholarly or academic experiences for me personally. Um, when I decided to, um, I decided to move back to the United States in the mid 1990s and 
was um, recruited, I guess, to work in Japanese language uh, education as I'm not a, I don't have any training as a teacher myself, but um, I ended up actually um, becoming an administrator at AATJ, the American Association of Teachers of Japanese, in order to start something called the Bridging Project, Bridging Clearinghouse, uh, to promote study abroad in Japan by American students. At the time this happened, which was in 1997, I think, um, there were, as, uh, as Paul was saying, it was kind of, it was shortly after the high point of uh, Japanese students studying in the US. And on the other hand, there were fewer than 1800 American students studying in Japan, according to the official statistics. Um, so uh, Kalkan and the Japan US Friendship Commission decided that they wanted to change that and, and sort of change that balance a little bit and encourage more American students to go to Japan. So they, um, they started or inspired this um, bridging clearinghouse project. And they felt that the logical play, the logical people to promote this were people who teach Japanese because mm -hmm. they would have a really powerful motivation for their students to go to Japan. Um, yeah. to become more proficient in the language and culture. So, uh, so that was, as, as Tom said, um, the, the Bridging Foundation has, has, been a, has been a part of this because promoting study abroad in Japan ended up, um, it ended up being that the biggest problem keeping students from going was the cost. Mm -hmm. They were interested in many other ways um, and there were other obstacles, but they were, those were easier to overcome um, than the financial one. So, Thank you, Susan. Um, if you don't mind, I, we are going to get further into. Um, oh, okay. I'd love to ask you more questions okay. about that specifically. Yeah. But okay, so that's. I want to give a chance. No, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. No. 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 Um, it's fascinating. Um, and Matt, I'd like to just turn it over to you to ask about your own, you know, maybe a, just a, a meaningful experience you had internationally that. Um, you know, reflecting on it had a big impact on you and in, in your career and life trajectory. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, and uh, good evening, everyone in the U.S. Ohayou gozaimasu. Nihon ni irashiru minasama. It's wonderful to be a part of this uh, webinar uh, today and with the, the panel. It's such an important subject. And yes, we're, we're facing uh, challenging times uh, with the pandemic, but surely these exchanges will, will restart and I think the intention of the, the Bridging Foundation and the ICU Foundation is just to remind people that this is, this is such a powerful and important uh, experience. And my personal experience is that I never expected that I would live or, or, or go overseas. I'm, I'm a pretty timid person at heart uh, about these kinds of things, but I was very fortunate um, to grow up uh, surrounded by these experiences. Uh, uh, much like Susan, um, when I was younger, when I was a boy, uh, my family hosted exchange students from around the world. Um, we got our first exchange student when I was 10 years old. Uh, he was from Japan. He was from Shizuoka. He stayed in my room. We got bunk beds. Uh, he lived on the, he stayed, he, he slept on the top bunk. I was on the bottom bunk. Uh, he knew two words like yes and no. And uh, I, I, I didn't know any Japanese, but somehow we communicated. He had a Walkman. It was fascinating. Um, and uh, we went to Disneyland together and he ended up becoming my brother. And then every year uh, we got a different exchange student, uh, some from Japan, some from uh, Spain and other countries. Um, and then when I uh, turned uh, 14 years old, my dad said to me one night, well, how about you? Would you like to go and, and study abroad uh, for a little while? And I was 14, I wasn't thinking seriously about it. I was like, sure, that sounds good. And he's like, well, where would you like to go? And I was like, well, Spain seems kind of interesting. And then one week later, he put it together and, and uh, said, you're going, to, you're going to Spain for the next year. I was like, so kind of like uh, Kazuyo-san was saying, you know, she was kind of forced into it. So I was forced into it too. I, <laughs> I said, what? I, I couldn't believe it, but I, I went to, went to Spain uh, for a year in high school there. 
I knew no Spanish. Uh, I knew very little about the culture, but like Susan was saying, I was immersed in it. Um, I ended up making wonderful friends. I, I At the end of the year, I thought I was Spanish. I, I didn't speak any English for over a year, so I forgot how to speak English. Um, and uh, it was just a fantastic experience. And just like uh, Kazuyo-san was saying, um, because it was so hard, it was so, so, so challenging. It really pushed me. It, it kind of fast forwards your skill set. It, it helps you um, think about problem solving and getting along with people. And it really pushes you, uh, forces you to, to adapt. And, and that's such a, such a powerful uh, experience uh, for me. So I have, I have uh, at the time, I think it was really hard. I, I probably cried a lot. I probably lacked confidence. Um, I was embarrassed by making mistakes uh, in Spanish all the time, uh, but you know somehow you accomplish it, and it, you feel you feel like wow, I I I did that. You know, it becomes a uh, you know uh, something that that stays with you the rest of your life. And uh, because I had that early experience um, later when I moved to Japan and learned Japanese and li was living in Japan, uh, it didn't feel as hard. I already knew kind of some of the challenges that I would face. I was fascinated with Japan. Um, and uh, like Susan was saying, I, I went there for one year to teach Japanese and I ended up staying 25. <laughs> I just came back to the United States a few months ago. So, <laughs> and so uh, I often say, uh, you know, koyu kao shitemasu kido. I have this kind of American face, but I am like inside, I am totally Japanese. <laughs> <clears throat> that's, that's great. Thank you, Matt. Um, well, I mean, there's, um, I think a couple of you mentioned, uh, Kazuyo and Matt, you mentioned, you know, that it can be challenging, can be the difficulty struggle, but that, you know, getting through that and then, you know, learning how to be a problem solver, getting along with uh, other people, learning languages is another thing that, yeah, and all of these things can really help to shape people um, and to build confidence um, and, and an awareness also of the world and, and of the self, right? So that's, that's fantastic. Um, I'd like to dig a little bit more now uh, into, you know, your current work and um, maybe there's a connection there that you can draw directly from your personal experiences that you spoke about, but um, maybe Kazuyo, we can go back to you. Um, so JCIE is, you know, involved in international exchange at uh, the level of uh, practitioners and policymakers and uh, you do a broad array of work in areas like global health, philanthropy, democratic governance, foreign policy. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, how and why is international exchange important um, within the various areas that JCIE is engaged in? And maybe you can start just by providing a brief overview of, uh, of the work and uh, maybe a couple of uh, concrete examples as well. Right. So uh, as an introduction, JCIE USA is a U.S. nonprofit organization. We are founded in 1975, and we do promote um, stronger U.S.-Japan relations. And as you said, uh, at the professional and political leadership levels. And um, some of our programs focus on nurturing better understanding of Japan and U.S.-Japan relations among those groups in the United States who have significant influence in policy making, like congressional staff, uh, who we've been taking to Japan since 1982 to uh, study uh, on a study trip. Um, other programs, we pr promote um, research and policy dialogues uh, between both current and future leaders in the United States and Japan uh, on issues that matter to both countries. So um, we work in close partnership with JCIE Japan in Tokyo to do that, but the kinds of issues just to illustrate that um, our programs address include you know, things like how can the United States and Japan work to advance global health, including uh, the global response to COVID-19. How can we strengthen democratic governance in Asia um, as two democracies? How can we strengthen women's political participation? We try to draw lessons from each other as well on things like what can we learn from Japan's um, policies about uh, to, to promote healthy and active aging, for example. Um, and, and these uh, programs produce outcomes 
that are tangible, like policy recommendations that it feed into uh, actual policies, which is important. Uh, but also, um, as an exchange organization, we place a lot of value on intangible impact, which we think is also important. And these are things like this uh, greater appreciation for U.S.-Japan uh, relations and personal ties that you develop with your counterparts. And one thing I always try to emphasize to our funders um, is that these the impact of these exchange programs don't happen uh, don't show up overnight, and it takes years for it to show up. Um, and and I would mention uh, one of our uh, key supporters, Congresswoman Diana Deget from Colorado. She was uh, uh, participated in our exchange program twenty years ago, but now she is leading the congressional study group on Japan and also encouraging other women in Congress to. Um, uh, learn more about Japan, uh, but it took 20 years uh, and, 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 and for, for, for that to be visible to others. So um, we do this work to um, do this, uh, to have this kind of impact. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a, a great, great that, you know, the tangible and the intangible um, and like you just mentioned, sometimes it's really long-term, you know, the outcomes are, you know, they're not, short-term outputs, they're really long-term outcomes that we're talking about. And um, that is related, I think, to the power of international education um, and speaks to that as well. Um, Susan, if you don't mind, um, I would love to hear now, if you, uh, you, you started to talk a little bit about the work that you do with the Bridging Scholarship. Um, yeah. And I'd uh, you know, love to hear a little bit more about that program. Um, you know, if you mm -hmm. could describe the objectives and you know, the impact that the program has had. Right. Um, well, the objective is to um, help more American undergraduate students um, go to Japan. So um, we, we started offering scholarships in 1999 and since then have awarded about 2000 students scholarships that help them go to Japan on an exchange program or an independent program that they get credit for at their home university mm -hmm. um, for either a semester or a year. Um, and I think one of the, one of the strengths of um, the program and one of the strengths of, of Japan study, I think for students is that it tends to be a little longer um, in study abroad in general, um, over the years that I've been doing this, the students seem to want to go for shorter and shorter times. Um, it, back, you know, several decades ago, going for a, an academic year was, was the most common thing. Um, and gradually students wanted shorter and shorter times, but the students who go to Japan do want to go for longer times. Um, it's, it's, un, it's unusual in the study abroad community um, that the students do tend to stay longer. Um, they have a lot, they have quite varied interests. Um, again, over the time I've been doing this, um, the, the field, the majors that the students have have, have changed quite a lot mm -hmm. um, from um, Japanese history and literature, all of these things are still there, but then uh, there was the manga and anime motivation, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but now a lot of students who study natural sciences, um, STEM students, and then also people who study um, social, social movements and trends who are interested in what's happening in Japanese society are interested in studying in Japan. Um, they, uh, they, a lot of them, they write to us after they come back. And of course, most of them say, you know, it was life changing, it was life transforming. And, and for many of them, it, it really is. It widens their horizons. It, um, it, it helps them to see the world in different ways. And of course, contrast it with their own. Um, and it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite rewarding to see the impact that even a even a relatively short stay um, in Japan can can have on them. The other thing that I have noticed is, and again, this is um, because I I 
I have a I have I work a lot in the in the study abroad community mm -hmm. because one of our challenges was working with um, the study abroad advisors at a lot of universities didn't ever, in the old days you know many students still do go to Europe but that was sort of the classic you have a student who wants to study abroad you don't really encourage them to go to Japan because it's really far away it's expensive it's hard and so we were trying to create the environment in which it seemed easier and a lot more accessible mm -hmm. um, and the so I do I have talked to an awful lot of study abroad advisors and one of the things that they notice is how the students who go to Japan really develop a close connection mm. with the country the community they lived in the culture um, even the language um, to an extent that they they notice it you know mm. that it that it see it stands out to them that this mm. is kind of special which says something about i think the u.s japan connection yeah so that's yeah that's, that's absolutely good. well thank you yeah um i mean i'm also biased i grew up in japan and i love japan but um i I'll, it seems to be that you know the interest level in Japan is very, very high these days. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I, I do hope that um, we can resume more exchange soon. The, inter um, the interest is still there. You know, in there. the past yeah. two years when students haven't been able to go, they haven't given up trying. They're, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're still, they're waiting and hoping. You know, Absolutely. It's really, yeah. Yeah. Matt, turning to you, um, you know, you've spent your career in international education from 2014 to 2021. You led the Fulbright Japan office. Um, as you just mentioned earlier, you recently returned to the US um, and uh, to co-found and lead the New Voice Learning. Love to hear about your mission at New Voice. Um, I understand it's an ed tech company focusing on developing conversational fluency in spoken English, but I don't really know very much about it. So I'd love to, to hear about, about that and how your previous experience has led to this and you know how it relates, how it differs, et cetera. Uh, wonderful, happy to share. Uh, so as you mentioned, I had the uh, honor to lead Fulbright Japan for seven and a half years uh, uh, until very recently. Uh, the Fulbright program next year will be celebrating its 70th anniversary uh, in wow. Japan. In fact, when the program was started, uh, Senator Fulbright uh, said that you know, the, the history of the United States with Japan and out of the destruction of World War II was, this is, you know, his vision of making a more peaceful world. And so Japan was always in the background of the Fulbright program, which by the way, operates in over 155 different countries, but Japan has a very special connection uh, to the Fulbright program. Um, since 1952, uh, you know, many, many uh, scholars and students have been studying in both countries. Many people have gone on to quite remarkable uh, careers. Uh, one example is that the president of the American Chamber of Commerce, Jennifer Rogers, uh, is a Fulbright uh, alumna. Um, so there's just so many wonderful people, a part of the community, trying to do, uh, in trying to build closer relations between both countries uh, to further the mission of mutual understanding, which is the basis of the Fulbright program and to create more peace uh, in the world. And, and at the time when the Fulbright program was initiated by Senator Fulbright in the light, late 1940s, this was very innovative um, to use the war material, the leftover material from World War II to turn that into uh, money for scholarships for students uh, from Japan and other countries to come to the United States and for Americans to to teach and research and study in other countries as well uh, was incredibly innovative. It opened up the doors for many people who had never been able to go overseas before. Uh, the new work that I'm doing, New Voice Learning, is uh, using voice technology to help people around the world boost their English speaking ability for uh, academic and career advancement. I think if Senator Fulbright uh, were uh, still alive and he wanted to do something new and, and make an impact on the world, he would be doing something in ed tech with voice technology. Uh, so I, I think I'm trying to harness uh, his energy to do, to do something new. And the reason why I say that is it's, it's, 
is because I think exchange doesn't mean that you just have to go to the country and 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 be there. I think there's lots of ways to have exchanges. You can you can go to a, a Japanese no show in New York, or you can host a uh, you know a student from Iran just as Susan had done, or uh, you know uh, you can make a friend with a student, an uh, international student at your at your school, and and you can exchange and be exposed to ideas and learn about their culture that will you know open up. Uh, your horizons to possibilities that maybe you couldn't possibly have considered before. And so, of course, going and studying overseas is a very impactful experience, but uh, no matter how hard we work at this, and even the pandemic, I strongly believe it's going to come back, uh, you know, it's it's only something that really, uh, you know, a few people can do. There's an economic burden, uh, there's a time thing, and, you know, uh, a certain time in your life where these things are conducive to being able to to take advantage of an experience like this. Um, however, I think what is exciting about the technology and especially what we've learned from this pandemic is it's a lot easier to connect with people than, than we thought before. So we're seeing a huge uh, surge of interest in online tools, online learning. And so the vision for New Voice Learning is to connect people into a community uh, where they can uh, you know, uh, practice English and connect with each other, have cultural exchange uh, online. Uh, sharing virtually. Uh, th there's no reason why we can't do that. And mm -hmm. uh, this will open up the possibilities to millions of more people uh, to uh, interact. And uh, maybe in a small way, we can make the world a little bit more peaceful. So it's really exciting to me. We're just getting started. Uh, I would encourage anybody listening in, uh, please share it with your students or you know, certainly for yourself or anybody you know would be interested. Please go to our website, at newvoicelearning.com, we just launched the beta version of our English speaking practice app. Uh, we have several hundred people that have already signed up and are, are trying it from around the world. We have people from Brazil and from Nigeria, China, Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, Turkey. It's really exciting to see all of these people, um, a lot from India actually. So uh, there's a very strong interest from the developing world. Uh, for people to connect, to advance their careers, to talk with people, share ideas. Uh, so it's an exciting time to be uh, working in, in, in education and in technology and uh, kind of uh, opening access uh, to millions of more people around the world. Mm -hmm. That is exciting. That's, um, I'm excited to, I will sign up. I will try. I want to give it a try. <laughs> Please do. Please yeah. do. Um, well, I think that's a great segue um, to uh, the next sort of topic, which is, you know, looking at sort of what the impact of the pandemic has been on the work that you do and, you know, what have you learned from it? What lessons have you learned and, and how are you thinking about sort of incorporating those learnings into your work moving forward? Um, I know on my side, you know, at the Japan ICU Foundation, we, as I mentioned at the beginning, like we... We have an interest in DEI, sustainability, peace building. And, you know, just like you mentioned, Matt, just right now, um, you know, study abroad and higher education itself, um, you know, is not accessible to many, many people. Um, it's not as diverse as it should be. Um, you know, there's questions about the sustainability of all of us getting on airplanes all the time and flying around the world and, um, you know, how... How, how effective can we really be at building a peaceful world if it's really only accessible to a small group of people, right? So these are things we've been thinking about ourselves and um, maybe there's other, maybe those are things that resonate with you as well, or maybe there are other things, but um, maybe you can go uh, to Susan to start uh, now. Um, just curious as to you know, how, what you've learned during the pandemic and uh, looking forward, you know, how, you know, what you're, what you're thinking about terms of moving um, forward a lot yeah a lot of what i've learned during the pandemic um does have to do with using technology and what the mm -hmm. potential is but it's actually in the realm of language learning um mm. not so much in the study abroad and exchange um realm i i know that um so my so my mission is sending american students to japan and the universities in Japan that enroll those students um, have obviously been having a very tough time 
many of them have offered online courses to international students from around the world, including American students. And I think um, there, are, there are definitely numbers of students who are taking advantage of that and taking courses at, um, I don't know about ICU, but, I, but there are mm -hmm. some, other, some other universities in Japan that have developed some pretty impressive online courses for students around the world. Um, but the students, the students find that a bit limiting, you know, it's, it's, it's okay, but they want to make the personal connections. Mm -hmm. um, Japanese teachers, however, have, um, have expanded their abilities and their interests a lot um, during the pandemic. And as a professional organization, my um, AATJ has about 1500 members who, um, it's similar to study abroad. There are conferences, but a lot of teachers can't afford to take the time or pay to attend conferences. And since conferences have been online, they've been, uh, they've attracted more people. They've attracted a lot more, a, a more diverse um, attendance. And it's really expanded the things that, um, that people are doing professionally. So that's, that's, that's kind of been where the impact has been in, um, in what I do. I'm not quite sure, you know, with, with sending student, with study abroad in Japan for students, I think a lot of us are just waiting to be able to actually travel again. Sure. Um, <laughs> but there are other part, other parts of what I do that, that in which the possibilities have really expanded. That's that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Kazuyo, um, how has it been in, at JCIE USA? And um, I know you're very active with different online events and things of this sort too, but. Um, no, yeah. I think um, just like Susan and, you know, I uh, same with the policy experts and scholars, we counted on taking these people to Japan or the United States to have this in-person experience to develop this affection for the, an understanding about each other's cultures. Um, and, and it's the, and so I don't think, I think we're all waiting for that to come back um, despite understanding um you know, now, now understanding that, you know, you can save airfare costs to mm -hmm. still and, and still have uh, effective policy dialogues. Um, but it's the interactions that happen in between meetings and um, um, observations you make while you're on the bus or train, uh, seeing people bow and shake hands and so forth that really gives you that understanding of the other culture. So I think in the future, I think we'll try to take uh, the best of both sides um, and, and, um, and, and be creative. But I don't think the in-person component would go away. Uh, and um, one other thing that we observed or as a lesson or something I observed during the pandemic is at least in the US-Japan context and the work that we do, we did observe incredible generosity coming out of um, trying to respond to this pandemic. Uh, and um, at JCIE, we uh, worked with our Tokyo colleagues to establish this COVID Solidarity Response Fund um, and, and raised over $8.8 .8 million from Japan-based donors to contribute to the international response. Um, and, and a lot of these people were people who received the government stipend during COVID um, and they didn't really know what to do with. Um, and also I see a lot of civil society organizations coming together to talk about how we can make sure that the rest of the world gets the vaccines and the right treatment and um, testing and so forth. So one other thing I saw was in crisis, um, you know, people do come together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great point. And yeah, and going back to what you said about, you know, you can't really replicate a lot of the intangible, you know, um, you know, the relationship building parts of the, you know, of, of, of in-person exchange and, you know, yeah, you can't, you can't have an izakaya, for example, online. So, right. right. <laughs> That's just Almost. not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, yeah um, Matt, I mean, your, your work is sounds like is sort of 
um, positioned for this new world, um, you know, and uh, I was curious too about the focus on sort of conversational English and spoken English and, and not, you know, grammatically kind of correct or, you know, TOEFL, TOEFL English. <laughs> so yeah, right, could, you, right. could you talk a little bit about, I mean, maybe this is exactly what put, put you in this position, you know, the pandemic, I'm not sure, but how, how do you think about things? Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, certainly gives us a chance to re-engineer, rethink how we learn languages. And so, uh, you know, having this opportunity to uh, work with experts in technology and my background in international education, we have a chance to think again how this can really be effective. Uh, what's the best way for for millions of people um, to learn around the world. And if I reflect on my own experience and other people that I've had the opportunity to uh, interact with, uh, I've just really been uh, persuaded uh, by the immersion experience. So when I went to Spain, I didn't know any Spanish, but I was dropped in there and, uh, you know, okay, I had to learn how to say good morning. I learned, I had to uh, learn how to talk to my teachers at high school. I learned, I had to learn how to uh, talk to the guys on the soccer field about passing the ball to me. If I didn't learn that, they weren't going to pass the ball to me. So, um, you know, you're kind of forced into the situation or you just do it by, uh, you learn by doing. I, I, and that was really helpful for me because I didn't have any kind of structure in my head about how I was going to learn Spanish. I just needed to, uh, you know, go through the situations. And, uh, and, and that's how I approached actually learning Japanese as well. When I moved to Japan, um, I didn't, uh, attend any classes. I didn't have any teachers. Uh, I just tried to learn by talking first with everybody. I figured later I'll learn kanji. I'll learn to read later. But really what I want to do, and I think most people, the purpose of learning a language is to be able to have a conversation, to be able to talk to people, to share your ideas, hear their ideas. And also through the language, you deepen your understanding of the culture. So you feel like, oh, that's what that means. And you can you can, uh, you know, uh, feel like, okay, you're, uh, you're kind of digging deeper into your understanding of what you're observing and what you're experiencing. So I think uh, the approach with our, our platform is that learners jump right on and they just start speaking no matter what you have. It's okay if you can't speak quickly, if the words don't come to you, you can just do, redo the lesson, but you're stimulated through the conversation. So you're prompted with a question, you respond to it and you go through it and you can practice it over and over again until uh, you get it just right. And I think that's the experience of study abroad is it's, called, you know, in Japanese, they call it shikosakugo, you know, just doing things over and over again until you get it right. Practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, really applying yourself and doing it over and over. And I, I'm optimistic that this will make rapid progress uh, for a lot of people. And the space that we're looking at is actually intermediate level learners, not beginners, but intermediate level learners who want to get to the advanced level. Mm. I've met many people who have TOEIC scores that are very high, uh, but they have they don't have the confidence to speak up. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we're having Zoom meetings, they have to participate in business meetings and you can't catch all of the conversation because there's a lot of slang expressions. I talked with some learners uh, to say, you know, what what are some of the things that are holding you back or, it, you know, that is, is hard for you? They say, well, people will throw out expressions like give me a ballpark figure or it's all downhill from here or you're crushing it. You know, these words, I'm crushing it. I'm crushing what? Is, oh, is that bad? You know, like, no, crushing it means you're doing a great job or if it's going downhill, it you know, somebody might think, okay, is that a bad thing? No, no, no. It means things are going to get easier from this point of view. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of colloquial uses of English um, that I think native speakers take for granted. So we're also trying to uh, impart those kind of cultural insights through the lessons and help people really feel a little more confident jumping into the conversation 
Um, and I, I really am a firm believer that this kind of small talk, whether it's in the, in the classroom when you're talking to your professor or you're working with other students in your group, or if you're in a you know international company and you're trying to work together and problem solve together, it's these little small talks that build the relationships um, mm -hmm. and it can make your academic and, and work life more successful. That's, I think, so true. <laughs> so that's great. Um, well, we want to open it up soon to questions um, from the audience, and we have some questions already. But before we do that, um, since we're, you know, we are looking at Japan, the U.S., and Japan and the U.S., um, you know, we'd love to give you a chance to just comment on, you know, why you think, you know, international exchange and collaboration between Japan and the U.S. is important. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you have something to say about this, given uh, the work that you, you do. Uh, Susan, do you want to go ahead and start that? Well, I think, um, I mean, there's the history, you know, these, these are two countries that were bitter enemies and over a few decades have grown into allies, friends. Um, there are there are now, there's such a web of interconnection at the economic level, um, the educational level, cultural, just about every level you can think of. So many connections that um, becoming enemies again is, is just kind of unthinkable. So it's, it's an example, I think, of how that can happen mm -hmm. in the world that, that could be useful in other in other realms as well so that i feel that makes it kind of important yeah that's great thank you uh kazuyo do you have anything to add right. to i completely agree with susan we have this history to build on um the reason jci usa a work on us japan cooperation is um in addition two things i would say the first is by the sheer scale of uh, impact we could achieve by the world's first and third largest economies working together. Um, and another thing is something that I felt in my gut living between the United States and Japan. And, um, you know, it's a cliche to say we share values, but it's true. Uh, I think um, these are countries upholding the same fundamentally important things in life um, and one's happiness, like um, good education, good health, uh, the ability to choose your leaders um, and things like that, which I think is the reason why I developed strong affection for both countries, uh, growing up in both countries, um, despite the huge differences that we do observe um, in terms of school systems and you know how we relate to one another. So um, I think that's that's why we see a lot of potential in US Japan cooperation and and invest in it. Great. Thank you. Matt. I love this question. Uh, this is something I'm so passionate about. Um, you know, the relationship between Japan and the US is so powerful. And I've heard ambassadors say this over and over, but it's the cornerstone of security and prosperity in East Asia, you know, it's in the world. Uh, it's just remarkable uh, how much the United States and Japan have done. And I've spoken with many leaders who are concerned about this needs to be sustained. Uh, for the betterment of the world. And so I feel a, a responsibility in anything I can do to, to help in that, in that effort. Um, in my level, I'm just a small guy, I'm a, you know, but uh, you know, we do people to people exchanges. It's really encouraging for me to see that on the people to people level. So for example, when I was with Fulbright, I, I love to be a part of the receptions and the social occasions when people got together. Um, it's just fascinating to see the friendships that are formed. An example is, um, you know, a, an architect in Japan would get connected with an American architect at one of our receptions. Uh, the Japanese architect would invite him over, you know, to his house for Ozone at the end of the year. Um, they become great friends. Their families spend time with each other in each country. And then after two or three years, they co collaborate on writing a book on architecture together and uh, share their knowledge with the world. I've seen that repeated over and over in so many fields in, in, in climate change, in education, 
in uh, you know uh, gender or diversity issues. Uh, there's just so much that we can collaborate on, and I've I've seen it in, in so many le levels. Um, what I would say uh, is kind of parting words is that being a part of the Fulbright program really filled filled me with optimism. There's so many smart, caring people out there in the Fulbright community that really want to make a difference. Um, and so I'm hopeful that there will continue to be just amazing, awesome research, uh, collaboration efforts between Japan and the US. Great, thank you, Matt. Well, we want to um, turn it on, uh, turn it over now to some questions from the audience. Um, I've got an absolutely agree from, I think that was to your point there, Matt, um, from a member from Linda Butcher. Um, so earlier on, one of the earlier comments, um, not a question as much, although we, we probably have some views about this. Um, it'd be great to hear um, from Satoshi Ire. Uh, he uh, says that, um, you know, international experience is good to open eyes, definitely. And uh, in reality, many Japanese communities are still under kind of sakoku, um, you know, in quotes, you know, <laughs> closed societies. So open societies are very limited. I hear frequently that the experiences can be negative if going to settle down in Japan in the end. You know, students, for example, being discouraged from going abroad because it might actually be bad for their careers or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and he says a movement to break through this actual disadvantage is really needed. And one of the solutions is to increase diversity in all Japanese communities. Fascinating uh, comment there. Um, any, any reactions or thoughts that that elicits from, from any of you? Uh, I would agree. Um, I think Japan will, will benefit a, a lot from diversity. Um, I kind of jokingly said that I'm Japanese, but I, I really believe that. I have just returned to my home country. And uh, I'm, I, one of the things that really blows me away about being back in the United States is how much diversity there is here uh, in Southern California. It's just remarkable. Um, I, 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 in our incubator, there's uh, people from India and, and Asia and uh, from all over the world. And uh, what unites us is a, a vision of trying to uh, you know, launch companies, make new products um, and using smarts. Uh, there's a lot of smart people here. Uh, you know, people with PhDs in engineering and biochemical, uh, you know, even subjects that you know, I, I don't even can say the names in them. It's just like, there's some smart, smart uh, people here. I, Japan will definitely benefit from this. And there was a trend of uh, international students increasing in Japan year after year, uh, reaching over you know 130,000, I think the, the number was uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, that's an important trend for Japan uh, for, for many reasons, uh, especially for uh, continued engagement with the world and, and for innovation. But, I, and I agree with the, the comment from the gentleman um, in the chat. I, I just also say that, um, you know, we have this issue in the U.S. as well. It's not just the United States. Uh, we have folks that would, uh, you know, benefit from having a little bit more open point of view. So it's not, mm -hmm. it's not just a Japan issue. It's a U.S. side issue as well. And so, um, you know, we we all have uh, work to do in that in that area. That's a very very good point, <laughs> um, <laughs> Kazuo or Susan. You you want to add anything to that? Um, I would just agree with Matt. What Matt said, um, I was going to mention exchanges are important because if you just leave it without them, um, Americans and Japanese can be quite inward looking and mm -hmm. narrow minded, um, as you've observed from political climates uh, in both countries. So it's not just Japan. And I would also agree with Matt that, um, uh, and the common, uh, uh, the gentleman that, um, uh, diversity would be beneficial. And I've already seen a lot of tourists before COVID in Japan that have changed the Japanese attitude. I've, I've seen um, Japanese become more assertive against the rude tourists. So um, I do think those opportunities would hopefully um, also help. Hmm. Great. Yeah, I, I just just quickly, I agree with that and that there's a lot a lot of work to do because it seems that the anti-immigrant, anti-open uh, segments of many societies, including both of ours, um, are are growing more powerful, and it's there's a lot of work to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Um, David Wagner has a question that he put in the Q&A box about um, language learning online. So he says that um, seems to be a trend in Japan with language learning online uh, moving away from using native speakers towards uh, non-native speakers. And maybe this is, um, he, he speculates, you know, financially motivated and non-native speakers are, I'm sure, cheaper. <laughs> um, and, you know, I guess maybe Matt in particular, since you're now in this, working in this area, curious, do you have any comments about that? This is a great question. Uh, and I, I kind of frame it also um, in, in the diversity issue as well, you know, similar, similar topic is, I think, uh, you know, when I was living in Japan, or I would try to help friends, or I teaching English, uh, there's uh, this strong kind of attention on native speakers, I want to learn North American English, you know, uh, I, I don't want to learn, you know, uh, Australian English, or, you know, they have like a some, some learners have kind of a mindset that they think they need to learn uh, a certain type of English. Uh, however, in, in the way the world is so interconnected, the chances are that if you're going to be using English in the future, you'll be using it with a lot of different people uh, in a lot of different contexts. Um, so it's actually to your advantage to, to speak with lots of different people um, and to harness, you know, uh, understanding, you know, English in different in different countries. So uh, our platform is uh, we're building a community where learners can actually chat with each other um, and, and practice with each other, uh, connect and have chats. And that, that I, I think is going to be a big change from the learning experience. Uh, you don't need to pay an expensive online tutor to practice English. Uh, you can uh, you know, a Japanese person can chat with somebody from Brazil and somebody from Spain and somebody from India uh, and learn about their country and uh, share about Japan. And those interactions uh, will benefit them for language, but also for the perspective of diversity. Absolutely. It, uh, Susan, you just commented, I see in the chat there, uh, global, global English. Global <laughs> English. Global, global <laughs> Englishes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there are many varieties of English. Yeah. And it's it's good to have all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all valid and they're all, you know, that's so yeah, it's it's really important. Um, there are varieties of Japanese too, for that matter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um we have a question here from uh Takehito Kamata. Um he asks, uh, he wants to ask a question regarding the faculty members who conduct research on Japan-U.S. relations. Uh, faculty research and education are the important factors that are likely to influence the curiosities uh, and learning experiences of university students. Let me give some examples there. Uh, how could we create an engaged teaching and research opportunities uh, for emerging faculty members in all academic disciplines in Japan and the U.S.? who conduct international collaborative research between the two countries? Um, fascinating question. Um, Kazuo, do you, would you like to? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm just catching up on the question. You sure. might want to start with somebody else. OK, sure. Um, so I think, well, Matt or Susan, do you, have you had a chance to? I think it's Matt's area. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Put sure, your full bright sure. hat back back on, back yeah, on Matt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boom. And also uh, yeah. opportunity, maybe maybe online opportunities. <laughs> right, right. So uh, at Fulbright, we supported uh, faculty uh, research and also uh, you know teaching as well. Um, both programs are very beneficial, I think, to the faculty themselves, but also has the multiplier effect when they come back. Uh, to the United States or they come back to Japan, that they can share it uh, with their students, uh, uh, what it was like. So we've had some Japanese faculty members come to the United States during an election year, and they can describe, you know, what the country is like and what kind of debates go on and what the experience is like uh, to their students when they, when they come back. Um, and so that's an eye-opening experience. But other, you know, professors will join like an American barbecue or be invited over to a Thanksgiving uh, dinner, and they'll describe that cultural experience uh, to their students. So uh, faculty and, and professors, teachers, it's very important that they also participate in the uh, exchange experience as well, because 
they have such a powerful voice, it's, it's a powerful influence on the students. And so they can have that multiplier effect to uh, uh, share that experience with others, encourage them uh, also uh, to participate in exchanges. Susan I, or Kazuo? I, I, can, I can mention a couple, um, some of the Japanese language faculty um, in both high schools and universities that I know of have um, have have very have done some very creative things, um, taking groups of students to Japan to volunteer um, after the um, after the triple disaster in Tohoku. Uh, there were a lot of people who organized projects around communities that they had personal connections with in Tohoku, and um, took. This is less for research then, but it's but it speaks to I think developing students' curiosities and connections to to um, to develop some some of those creative kind of programs that get them connected and involved. Great, thank you. Um, I think there's a comment here from uh, Ken Kiyoshi, who. It's talking about, um, well, just that, uh, I guess, similar to perhaps the earlier comment, oh, it's, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the, so he says, I wish that I had had a chance to go to the US when I was in high school or in college at, uh, when I was less shy and more open to develop friendships. I did have a chance to study in the US at the graduate school level, but I found it was too late in my case as to, uh, to help develop his English conversation. Uh, skills, I guess. And he says further down that, you know, relating to my point, I find that Mr. Kono, uh, who ran for prime minister, um, but failed is very interesting. He went to a U.S. college and developed good friendship, was exposed to the U.S. culture and politics through his four years, I believe it was mm -hmm. at Georgetown University. Um, and he wrote a book called Nihon Maya Ni um, which I think is pretty popular, if I understand. But um, any uh, any comments about sort of this? I guess it's really related to the time in life and when you have a chance to go and you know how it can be different at, at later stages. Um, maybe this would be a good uh, question to look at. You know, both like undergraduate, high school undergraduate. And, you know, a lot of you mentioned Kazuo. You mentioned you know having this experience as a young person you know, in the U.S. and mm -hmm. and then Matt. You know, when you were I think fourteen, you said going to Spain and. And Susan, yourself, you know, later in life. And then Kazuyo, your work is really focused on exchange for people who are, you know, by nature, just older. Um, I'm curious you know, what you think about this. I think uh, first he should look at Matt's <laughs> tool to see yeah. if he can benefit from it. Um, which is, I, I think your, your uh, endeavor is so amazing, Matt, by the way. <laughs> but um, um, one thing I want to, I'm, I'm not quite sure um, if it's too late for uh, Ken, uh, uh, for for the gentleman to um, start using English because English is just a tool, and communication is another thing. And oftentimes, uh, because I don't have the pronunciation issue, people think, "Oh, you just know, like you can't, <laughs> you don't have to worry about pronunciation and so forth." But when I had good English pronunciation, I was a terrible communicator in English, and I needed to learn how Americans communicate in order to actually talk like I do now. So. Um, just, I, I don't know what inhibits uh, the gentleman from trying to use English now, but it's not just learning the grammar and um, people can be perfect with TOEFL scores, like Matt said, but I think it's not, it's never too late to learn how to communicate. I've seen a lot of assertive non-English native speakers from other countries do TV interviews on news channels and have always been impressed how they can communicate despite this terrible grammar and and so I think confidence is a big uh, big issue here. Mm. And maybe I don't I mean I think that this may not be true, but when you're younger, you know perhaps you don't have a choice in some instances. I think you mentioned both of you, you know Matt, you, your dad put you on the plane a week later. <laughs> And Kazu, Kazu, you, you, you know, you were not 
course, you have a choice not to go to the States, for example, but, you know, gaining that confidence, um, it, you know, is, is in, in, in maintaining that sort of confidence too throughout your life is, could be a challenge, um, you know, as you kind of get more, as you get older, maybe it's, I don't know, I find myself, for example, just, it's getting more comfortable, more set in my ways and, you know, it's important for us to keep challenging ourselves, maybe, um, to, you know, to learn new things. And maybe that can be part of it, too, overcoming that. Matt, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, if I could share a personal story. You know, one of the things I really admire about Japan is how active the older population is, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're playing sports. If you go to a park in Japan, the tennis courts are full of very ganky uh elderly people having fun, uh, you know, and I think that's wonderful. I've, I've met many people who are still studying a different uh, subjects, learning English or doing Ikebana. Um, I think that really inspires me to live a healthy, long life. Um, mm. I, I certainly don't want to retire at any age. I, I want to be like what I saw in Japan, where I'm active and I'm still learning uh, very late into my life. And, when I first came to Japan, I was an English teacher, and my favorite student was a gentleman who was in his 80s, actually. He would come to, to school. He, he walked very, very slow. But when he was in the classroom, he was super focused on the lesson, and uh, he tried so hard to learn. Uh, and of course, his progress wasn't as fast as somebody who was younger or maybe who was... Uh, you know, uh, in a different stage of their life, but he was highly engaged. He was learning every day. And actually just to Kashiro-san's point, he was a great communicator. So even though his English wasn't very strong and he was, uh, you know, he didn't have the vocabulary, uh, his speaking speed was slow. We actually uh, talked about the war because when he was a boy, he was making some of the materials and, and we discussed that in a very personal level. And uh, we both were kind of moved. Uh, he had the opportunity to share his experience with me and I was able to learn from him about what position was like with him and it made it human for me. And mm. uh, I had a, a much more uh, better appreciation for that. So I really looked forward to the lessons that I had with that gentleman. Mm. That's, that's great, that's, that's powerful, that's great. Um, Susan, do you have any, maybe I can go, can go around and have a chance to, I don't, I don't see any further questions from the audience. So maybe we can, yeah. um, if you, I, I was just thinking, yeah, I was thinking some of the, some of the, um, some of the people I've known who've been most, what should I, sort of successful at maybe at what we're talking about are, are, they're often people who did have an experience at a mm -hmm. younger age. Um, and then maybe sometime later in their life it it they they kept move they sort of kept held on to it and later expanded on it mm -hmm. in in maybe different ways and so it it acquired more of an it made more of an impact on their life over a longer period of time but often often starting early mm -hmm. yeah yeah we have to learn how to learn right and yeah <laughs> and stick with it too so right you know i it's like a, education is a lifelong, lifelong pursuit. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you all so much. I want to give you a chance to ask each other if you have any questions for each other that have come up through the conversation. Um, and if you don't, that's fine. And if you, if you don't, but maybe you want to have some final comments that you'd like to share, uh, I'd like to give you all an opportunity to do that. Um, anybody want to volunteer? I did have a question to Great. Susan and Matt. Um, you both um, mentioned how these international students um, that you encountered in early in your life opened up your eyes, but how do you uh, nurture this kind of openness to something that's different or someone who's different among children and students? Um, um, because there, as, as we discussed, there's a lot of inward looking <laughs> um, um, uh, sentiments around. And I just wonder, how do you nurture uh, children who 
are open to? Uh, uh, how did you become so open to different cultures? Mm. That's a great question. What what popped into my mind while you were asking that question was that I I feel that I I feel that um, technology, social media, things like that 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 weren't really there when I when I was young. Those things all those things offer an opportunity, I think, to widen young people. You know, they they do they are exposed. They can be exposed in those ways to other cultures and people who have different values um it it's it's a it's a possibility i'm not saying it'll happen necessarily and may but maybe there are ways to use that to promote more intercultural curiosity mm -hmm. because because people it's easy to be exposed to you know k-pop and things like that you know are mm -hmm. are things like that have had a big impact i think on young people and they don't always think of it, I think, in the same way that we do, like, oh, they're having an international experience. They, <laughs> they, they kind of don't think of it that way, but actually they are. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is a great question, Kazuyo-san. Um, I don't know if there's any kind of clear answer. Um, just, but speaking from my own experience and as a father, um, I would certainly want my children also to have the best opportunities in life. And I believe that if you have uh, kind of open-mindedness, uh, if you're interested and curious uh, about the world, uh, the opportunities for you going forward are going to be so much better. So as a parent, I want that so much for my children. Um, and if I reflect on my own experience, uh, I was fortunate that I had a father that had that foresight. Um, but also I think that I had like little um, micro interactions that kind of led up to, to where I could be able to say, well, okay, maybe I can do that. So, you know, I had exchange students in our house and, uh, you know, we would go to like a play or we'd listen to music and it's like, oh, where's that music from? And maybe just a little bit of exposure. You talk to a little bit of people and it, 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 something changes where it's, it's not as foreign, but it turns into curiosity. Um, and so I think, um, you know, if you can take those kind of micro steps uh, with people. So, for example, I, I think, you know, study abroad is, is if you're fortunate to get a Fulbright, you know, scholarship or a, a bridging scholarship, wonderful. Um, but it, even if you can't have that there, you can you can host a Japanese exchange student. Uh, you can uh, look up your local uh, Japanese embassy. Um, the U.S. Embassy. Uh, it has a whole section dedicated to doing cultural exchanges. Would love to hear from schools. Uh, with, uh, the U.S. Embassy talks to schools in Japan, uh, visits the schools and, and gives talks. Um, there's many ways to create these kind of little interactions, these little exchanges um, mm -hmm. that will help people uh, maybe hear something different that they haven't heard before. And it's like planting a seed. So I had lots of those little interactions so then when I did finally have the opportunity to go to Spain or I had the opportunity to come to Japan, uh, it didn't feel as scary as it might have been if, if I hadn't had that before. Thank you. Um, Matt or Susan, do you have any questions for each other? Hmm. <laughs> I'm looking forward to looking at your website. <laughs> I've, I've <laughs> found out about it. Now we now we all have to explore and see what uh, see what it is that you're doing. <laughs> well, thank you. So uh, I get this is a beta version. So uh, technology people say this is something that is still a work in progress. So feel free to send us your feedback. Say you need sure. to fix that or this need yeah. to be better this way. Uh, uh, but we are you are, you, are you is there are you thinking of expanding it to a, a multilingual kind of thing at some point? I think there's potential for that, yes. Um, we're focusing on English first because uh, this is you know, a, language, a global language that, that uh, helps a lot of people advance in, in their life, but I certainly think it could work uh, for other languages. And I think uh, maybe a little bit down the road, we can explore that. Thank you for the question. Maybe, Paul, I could ask you a question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so 
I know that you're active. That uh, I believe you went and petitioned. Uh, mm. Is it uh, Mr. Uh, Yamaguchi san? <laughs> Yamanouchi. Yeah. 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 yeah, the 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 consul in New York, and you've been active in trying to. Uh, you know, uh, facilitate exchanges again and get things started going in both countries. Is there any update on on, on students uh, being able to go back into Japan or or the status? Uh, you know, your talk with Yamanouchi San about you know Japanese students coming to the U.S. Thank you for the question, Matt. Um, the the news is uh, the positive on the positive side. Uh, Japan has started to process visas again for international students. The problem is that there's a huge backlog. About 370,000 students are trying to get into Japan. This is including, you know, language school students, you know, technical training programs, um, you know, universities, graduate schools, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge backlog, um, and the government is, you know, working to process these. And so they've created a kind of um, sequenced. Um, uh, process where depending on when you received what's, what's called the certificate of eligibility, which is what you need to go to your local consulate or embassy to get your visa. Um, the certificate of eligibility is, the, is what's given to you first. And, you know, students who received their certificates last year, for example, are being prioritized over people who received it more recently. And so there's kind of a line now or a queue uh, to enter the country. And what we're learning is that uh, students who received their COEs, their you know, certificates of eligibility before, um, let's say like August or July of this year, they should be able to enter Japan as soon as maybe March, hopefully before, you know, for those who start on, you know, April, like the academic Japanese academic calendar, then hopefully before the beginning of that spring term or beginning of the, the new academic year. But for study abroad, it's more complicated. I think that for a lot of institutions, there was hope that study abroad would be able to resume in the spring. Um, and that is, I think, out of the question at this point. And um, about next September, yes, that's what we're hearing. And it looks positive. Um, you know, it was, it was great. I mean, thank, I really want to thank everybody who signed the petition. We had over 650 uh, signatories from the higher education and uh, nonprofit community. Um, and I was able to deliver that. And I think it helped a bit. I don't know. <laughs> you know, what, we never know what happens behind closed doors, but um, they, they did, they have announced now and they've started to process these uh, student visas. I think it was very effective. You you turned in the petition, and then a week later, they announced that they were starting up the visas again. So, Paul, you're either amazing. lucky timing, or was it <laughs> yeah, effective, or? But um. Well, no, I can only you. imagine how stressful it had been for 370,000 students, their lives suspended, yeah. waiting for their studies to start. Uh, it's just unbelievable. I hope those students can come back to Japan and continue their studies, have wonderful experiences in Japan. It's very important. Uh, both for Japan, but also for those students to go forward with their lives. Um, I think probably waiting uh, has been a very hard experience, but if I can say anything about Japan is that once Japan makes the decision, they're very, uh, uh, you know, um, quick and, and, and uh, steady about, you know, making sure everything goes smoothly. So now that the decision is made and things can go forward, uh, those students can look forward to, to coming back to Japan. That's, that's really wonderful news for them. So Paul, uh, mm. you know, uh, you know, high commendations to you mm. for the excellent work you have done and all the people that supported you in that important position, uh, petition. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Well, any final comments from oh, Susan? I, I wanted, yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask Kazio what, what, what is the, what is the, the, prediction of what will happen to you for your ex the pro exchange programs that you sponsor what will happen to them yeah so i mean are they a... yeah are, are they are they are they going to be able to move forward at some 
So our first in-person plan is probably in uh, next spring, uh, around June. Uh, uh, but we also have a backlog log of people that we want to take to Japan now. <laughs> and uh, yeah. it, it will uh, be a big delegation uh, if we take, uh, take one uh, the first time. Mm. June. Yeah, that sounds possible. <laughs> June mm. seems like yes. maybe that would work. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. It, I, Kazuyo san, I'm not sure. I, maybe you're able, you've been able to enter Japan. Have you, were you, were you in Japan at all during I the pandemic? Been, or, no? no, I haven't yeah. been okay. at all. No. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, 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 uh, it's limiting. Yes. Yeah. I was in Japan, in fact, at the beginning of the pandemic. I was living on the ICU campus and working there for a year and then came back to Japan in June of 2020, but haven't returned since. So it's, um, also looking forward to, to getting back to, to Japan. Susan, when were you last in Japan? Uh, just about exactly two years ago, mm -hmm. November, November of 2019. Yeah. And Matt, you came back. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I came back in, to the United States in July. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right, right. I was going to ask Susan, um, you know, what's the status of Japanese language in the United States? Um, I've, I've heard that- I had the exact other, same question. I've, I've heard that yeah. it's so popular uh, yeah. with students and there's mm -hmm. high demand. Mm -hmm. It is, it's true. Um, well, that's good news. Yeah, it is good news. Uh, there's a great, there's still a great interest in studying Japanese. The programs, there are programs, um, there, there've been problems with, you know, budget cuts and so on and programs uh, having problems, um, especially in high schools <laughs> uh, the, because it's just more difficult. But at the college level, it, it's been very steady and even growing. There are new programs. Um, there are, there's a whole generation of teachers that's retiring. Um, and so one of the problems that the field has, it's a good problem, is recruiting more teachers to start new programs and to and to take the place of people who are retiring. But it does continue to be, it continues to to, to be popular, which is a good, a very good sign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's great. Um, well, it's been such a pleasure to have this opportunity to, to talk with you all and um, I'm glad that it's kind of turned into more of a discussion here at the, near the end, which is, which is really great. Um, I am cognizant of time though, and um, I think we're only a couple minutes before the scheduled end of, um, so how about uh, you can just do a quick round and any final words from each of you um, before we wrap it up. Um, anybody want to volunteer? Well, I was feeling very pessimistic and I'm feeling more hopeful now. So I'm very great. glad we had this discussion. <laughs> that was the hope here. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Kazuyo, you have some. No, thank you so much, Susan, Matt, and um, Paul. It's been, um, I, I'm, my biggest takeaway is how advanced technology has become. And uh, it's, it's amazing that you have all these tools now to um, allow people to communicate. And one thing I should have mentioned that I didn't, uh, Paul is, uh, mm. my mother is a graduate of ICU. So Ooh, I, nice. I <laughs> learning a lot about the university and she's probably watching today. And uh, she, she, you know, um, I, I feel like part of the family because of that. So oh, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> I, I particularly that's appreciate this opportunity. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kazuo. Yeah. Matt? Uh, for me, uh, yeah. Thank you to everyone for this wonderful uh, webinar to revisit important issues like student exchanges and the U.S.-Japan relationship and uh, and just, you know, connecting on a person to person level. It's just, it's wonderful. Um, and I also like Susan and Kazuo san, I feel more hopeful about things going forward. Looks like things are moving in the right direction. Let's hope that it'll continue to do so. Um, in my new venture, if anybody in the audience or anybody, the panelists, if you have any interest in, in what I'm doing, I've, I've put my email address into the chat. Feel free to reach out to me uh, if there's anything I can do uh, to help you. Uh, if you're interested in, in what we're doing at New Voice Learning, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Awesome, thank you. Well, I wanna thank the panelists um, and you know for a really great uh, conversation and thank you for all the work that you do. Um, 
Um, thanks to Tom Mason. I can, can't see your video, but I see your face there. And uh, thank you so much to the um, US Japan Bridging Foundation for partnering. There you are, partnering on this webinar. Um, and I also want to thank uh, our co sponsor, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation, the OIS Foundation, led by David Jaynes, who probably many of you know, uh, for their help with advertising this webinar today. Um, and then finally, thank you for attending and for your great questions. I know that, you know, it, it's a webinar format, you know, unfortunately, we're not able to see your faces, but, um, you know, thank you so much for sharing your comments and questions. And maybe we can organize something in the future, where we can have more interaction with all of you. We will be, um, as, as you've seen, uh, perhaps this has been recorded. And so we, we will be uh, putting this up on, on YouTube um, and sharing it. Uh, so for those who weren't able to make it, we'll have a chance to, to tune in later. Uh, well, thank you so much and um, have a great day or afternoon, evening, wherever you are. All right, take care. Thank you. Take so care. Much. Arigatou gozaimasu. Arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.